Because of one man's trespasses, a lapse of fence, death reigned through that one, much more surely will those who receive God's overflowing grace, unmerited favor, and the free gift of righteousness, putting them into the right standing with himself, reign as kings in life through the one man, Jesus Christ, the Messiah and the Anointed One. Oh, there we go. Hallelujah. Can you hear me? Thank you so much for reading that. Meditate on that. All right, let's go with it. All right, here we go. For if because of one man's trespass, just say one man's trespass, who we know is Adam, lapse, offense, death reigns through that one, that is Adam. From Adam all the way down, right on to every one of us, death reign. Look what it says. Much more, everybody say much more. Much more. Surely will those who receive God's overflowing grace. Anybody in here have received God's overflowing grace? Raise your hand. All right. Let me tell you something about it. Because you have, which is unmerited favor. We didn't merit it. You can't earn it, not by works, not by our own efforts. And the free gift of righteousness, notice righteousness is a gift. God has given us his gift, his righteousness. Then it goes on and says, putting them into right standing with himself. Now notice this, we have been put in right standing with God. Right now, if you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you have been put in right standing with God. Nothing you've done, nothing I've done, He did it for us when He died on that cross. So you accept that by faith. Notice what it says, putting them into right standing with Himself, reign as kings in life, through the one man, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. All right. Now, when you read something in the Word of God, the first thing we're going to do is try to, to do it. Well, I'm going to be righteous today. The first time somebody looks at you with cross eyes, you, you, you fuss at them. No. God did it. You are righteous because he made you righteous. All right, now I want you to catch that. I'm going somewhere with this now. Let's put the next verse up there. 18. Well then, as one man's trespass, who is that? Adam, always identify. One man's false step and falling away led to condemnation for all men. So so, one man's act of righteousness, who is Jesus Christ, leads to acquittal and right standing with God and life for all men. Next verse. Would you bring the cross, put it up here for me, Floyd, I appreciate it. For just as by one man's disobedience, falling, failing to hear, heedlessness and curlessness, that many were constituted sinners. Now, a person does not sin. A person is not a sinner because he sins. Catch that, catch that now. A person is not a sinner because he sins. He, he is a sinner which causes him to sin. Not playing tricks, but you got to catch that. So we didn't, ha- ma'am. Who said something? Huh? Will you repeat that? Yeah. For just as by one man's disobedience, that's Adam. His disobedience. We had nothing to do with it. I didn't make myself a sinner. You didn't make yourself a sinner because of one man's disobedience. Who is Adam? All right. Failing to hear or heedlessness and carelessness, and many were constituted or made sinners. We were made sinners by Adam. Now, that, everybody agree to that. You understand that? Now, here's the blessed hope. 
Here's the next blessing. Let's, let's look at it now. So by one man's obedience, who is Jesus Christ, the many will be constituted or made righteous, made acceptable to God, brought into right standing with him. Now, we're on this side of the cross. You know, we're born, nice little babies. We all love babies. How many love babies? Half the people. How many don't love them? <laughs> I love them, but I don't want no more. <laughs> we had nothing to do with it. We, we were born in the world. And the reason that we were sinners and the reason that we sin is because we were sinners. And that's what sinners do. They sin. All right, got that. You didn't have to do anything. Everybody say, I didn't have to do anything. That's, that's important. I'm going to lead some. I'm going to use that later on when you cross the cross. So here we are. We're born in the world and we're doing fine. And then we find out why we do things like we do. We find out why we don't like this person, don't like that, throwing bricks at cops and, and spitting at your mother and kicking your father on the chins and all the things y'all used to do. You remember all those things y'all used to do. I remember all the things I used to do. Because we were born sinners. It wasn't our fault. You got to see this now, okay? So we've, we go to church one day, we hear the gospel preach. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So we find out, gosh, I'm a sinner. But I did, I know I've been stealing the cookies out of grandma's cookie jar, but oh, and all of a sudden we're convicted by the Holy Spirit that we are sinners, not by anything we've done, but we have been sinning. But we're sinners because of Adam. He made me a sinner. But the good news is, for Christ will make you righteous. So we say, we surrender our life to Christ. Then we find out that when Christ was crucified on the cross, old Bob Tilton, the old Adam in me, was crucified with Christ. And then we were buried. Boy, I'm glad to get rid of that old boy. He caused a lot of trouble, didn't he, huh? That old gal, I mean, she was, you know. And then God raised us up from the dead. When Christ was raised from the dead, we were raised. That is, our spirit man was raised and became a new creature, recreated by the power of God, that inner man. See, man is a spirit. He lives in a body and he has a soul. A lot of people, uh, as our sister was sharing, realizing a lot of things come out of her soul. A lot of things come out of all of our souls. Our souls have been damaged by the fall. It's been damaged by many times our parents, our teachers, and people that we have dealt with over the years. And we have a lot of healing that needs to take place within our being. But that has nothing to do with our eternal salvation. It's our spirit man that has been recreated, born again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 tells us that. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. He's a new creature. Our spirit man is. Well, what about these bodies now? What about these bodies? Well, good news again. Turn to 2 Corinthians. No, I'm sorry. Turn to Romans chapter 8. And let's start with, uh, well, let's start with, uh, that's good. Let's start with uh, <laughs> 18. 18, that's a good. But what of that? For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, now a lot of times we get all worked up about some of the sufferings that we've gone through, but I don't want to be mean and I know that there, there's some things that makes you sweat, like this coat, so I'll take it off. Uh, 
But when you compare most of our suffering with those in the first century Christians, in a way, we're almost like on a picnic. Now, you might not agree to that. I'm not trying to be ugly. Or if you consider some of our sufferings, to those Christians over there in the Middle East right now that's having their heads cut off, they've been bombed out of their, out of their country. Two, over 200,000 Syrians have been pushed out of their country and living in tents. I would say that's real suffering. Yeah. No air conditioning, not all the food. You can't just open the refrigerator and dive in. That's real suffering. But I know emotional suffering is bad too because I've been through that suffering for many years. Emotional suffering, physical suffering. Who likes it? Nobody. But look, but what of that? For I, I consider that the sufferings of this present time, this present life are not worth being compared with the glory with the glory, everybody say glory. glory, that is about to be revealed, about to be revealed, about to be revealed, about to be revealed to us and in us and for us and conferred on us. Now you've got to stop and see the suffering and then here's the glory. In us, for us. So when you compare the two, man, the little bit of suffering we're doing ain't nothing compared to the glory. Well, now, this is where belief comes in. All right, now, I'm going somewhere with this, so hold on. Let's go to the next verse. For even, for even the whole creation... All nature waits expectantly and longs earnestly for God's sons to be made known. Uh, waits for the revealing, the disclosing of their sonship. Now, what is he talking about? The animals all over the world. If you've been watching the TV and you see all these animals killing one another and eating one another and and, uh, but on the other hand, we do the same thing, don't we? We just don't kill them like that. They don't like that. They're groaning. Why are they groaning? For us to be revealed, the sons of, of God, that we come into our sonship. Because something's going to happen to this world. Something's going to happen to this planet. The curse is going to be lifted from the earth. Now, we must understand we're still in these physical bodies. And these physical bodies are still subject to diseases. You go out here and you drive a car. You do 100 miles an hour down the road and run into a tree. You're out of here. Your body can't stand that type of collision. You can't blame God. So these bodies are still subject. There are certain germs are passed from another person to another person, maybe through their breath or you touch somebody. Many things can be transferred from generation to generation. These bodies are, listen, subject, under the control. The word subject means under control. But this is where God has given us principles in the Word of God that we can walk in health and strength. That is His will. But there's certain health principles that we have to learn, and these bodies will fare be better, but eventually they will flake out. Everybody said, praise God. praise God. You don't want to live throughout eternities in your bodies. Some of you women are doing everything you can to keep your beauty. You buy all this lipstick and all this stuff you put on your face and... and, and uh, you know, this one guy got married to this woman, and she was so beautiful. And in and, and honeymoon light, night, she, she went in there and washed all of her makeup off, makeup off, and it scared him. 
And he, 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 he didn't recognize her. He wanted a divorce. You're not the one I married. Somebody loved me a little bit. That's why I love Susan. Makeup or no makeup. She's beautiful to me. She's pretty to me. And her hair's all rolled up. I say, come on, baby, let the good times roll. Ah, oh, it's still spring something in this old man at 82 years old. Woo! Ha! No. <laughs> okay, behave yourself, Bob. I'm trying. Now, let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next verse. For the creation, the nature was subjected to frailty, to fru uh, futility, condemned to frustration, not because of some intentional fault on its part. And let me say this, you can apply that to yourself. Really, it was Adam. That's true. We were constituted as sinners because of his failure. Remember, we just read that a while ago. And look what it says. Not because of some intentional fault on its part. Talking about the lions and the, and the tigers and the alligators and all out there chewing each other up. They live by, off of each other. Look at man. He doesn't do any better. I mean, they're over there in the Middle East. They're all fighting. And we could go into a study on that. You go all the way back to, uh, I want to say Esau. Is that right? Esau? Abraham's uh, son from uh, the bondwoman. Hmm? Ishmael. Ishmael. Thank you. Ishmael. Ishmael. Remember Ishmael? The prophet, I was, uh, the prophet, the prophet said on him that he would be a wild man, just fighting and killing. Well, that's what they're doing over there. Have you noticed that? Yeah. How many have noticed that? Oh, good, you're alive. That's right. And they just keep on keeping on. And when they capture uh, everything, then they, somebody else gets the itch and they're going to capture the next kingdom. If you read history, it's just one kingdom catching and then they catch it and do another one, another one, another, 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 another. So in this life, all of this killing, murdering the animals, the people, everything. And man has the ability now to blow the world up with atomic bombs. One thing you want to pray for, if an atomic bomb is, is uh, it comes down, just pray that you be right in the center of it. That way, boop, you're out of here. If you're about a thousand miles away and the, and, the, and the wind is blowing that way and all that radiation gets on you, it'll fry you good. It'll burn you real good. But you know what? Here one moment. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. See, I'm birthing that into your brain that you will tell fear to go out of town. Because we don't need to fear death because God annulled death through Jesus Christ. When he died on that cross, death was dealt with. All right, let's move on a little bit further now. Amen. Give God the glory. You don't have to feel de fear death. Not because of some intentional fault on its part, that is nature, but by the will of him who so subjected it, yet with the hope. Now, it has a capital H there. But I want you to see it in two ways. Adam subjected us to death and diseases and everything because of his disobedience. But on the other hand, God, you could say God did because Adam disobeyed God. God told him, don't eat that fruit. It's got a worm in it. If you eat that fruit, that worm's going to get in you and cause you trouble all the way down through generations after generation. Now, I'm just kidding about the worm, but it has that, that power of sin was transferred to all of us. Now look what it says. Now we're talking about our physical body now. Remember, Saved. our spirit.
We understand that? All right. Now we talk about these physical bodies, some of the problems that we all have. And yet God has made provisions for us to walk in victory, even though these old bodies give us a rough time sometimes. Have you ever noticed that they're always hungry? How many is always hungry? <laughs> Susan says, now you can't eat anything after five o'clock. But honey, you don't understand. That's my favorite time to eat. So I swing by the refrigerator. Shut it. I just want just a little something. You know, just a small sub. That's all I want. <laughs> See, you got, we got to overcome that tendency. See, I'm trying to look. Now, some of you have no problem. Some of you, if you don't eat today, you won't be here tomorrow. You're so thin today. You're just showing us all us people that have a little weight. You're just showing us, you know. But you ever notice that, that, that I don't want to say the word, but fat people are always happy. <laughs> it's them skinny folks that have a hard time. All right, I'm just, here we go. All right, look what it says. <clears throat> Let's go to the next verse now. Now get the picture, get the picture. That n nature, creation itself will be set free. Ah, catch it. When will it be set free? It will be set free. They won't be eating one another. They won't be killing one another. You can go into Africa and pet a lion. And he won't eat you. Take a rattlesnake up and kiss him. <laughs> Y'all want to see some jumping and jiving? How many want to see some jumping and jiving? One person over there. Where's that rattlesnake down here at? Well, this well, it's down. I don't I don't want Miss James to, to run out of here. <laughs> I'm looking out for you today now. I won't bring that snake out. Notice now, be set free from its bondage to decay and corruption and gain and entrance into the glorious freedom of God's children. See, this thing is bigger than just getting saved. This thing is so big that God is doing, He wants mankind to reign with Him throughout eternity. Not just for the millennium years, but eternities after eternities, ages after ages, God has plans for us and we'll be in our glorified body, and we will know life in such a freedom. How many remember when you was a little girl, and you just ran, 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 all, just out there scumping into jumping in a jumping rope? Oh. Huh? I remember that. No care. Time for dinner. You didn't care. Oh, can we play a little longer? Huh? How many remember that? Ver just barely, right? Okay. Free! All the pressure and all the, the, the weights coming down on you. But yet, as our teacher said in Sunday school, the weights are good for us. How many of you know that the, how you get strong? You go down to the gym and you pick these weights up for about 10 pounds like this, like this. Man, you're sweating. I mean, you're sweating. Man, I can't hold it. About three times and you've had it. But you keep at it. And after a while, pick it, those 10 pounds, this is nothing, you know what I mean? Wow, look at that. So what they do, they put another 10 pounds on each one of them. Say 10 and 10 is 20. That's 40. So now, ooh, oh, brother. How many know you strained? Oh, you strained. And after a while, about a month later, nothing to it. They would say, well, let's put another 10 on this, another 10 on this. 30, 30, 60 pounds. Oh, that's that strain again. Strain again. And there's another guy over there. He's on his 10. And you come over and say, add nothing to us. One hand, one hand. 
Some of the pressure that's on you is to make you strong. If you, if you go to the Lord, if you rely on him, Lord, the Lord is my strength. He transfers his strength into your bank account. I like that. And you become strong with his strength. Paul said it this way, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I am what I am by the grace of God. You can't make yourself into something according to the Bible. You cannot make yourself into some super duper hooper. You have to totally, by faith, rely on what God says. And when you put faith in it, and when you pray, you believe when you pray that you have it, and down the road somewhere, you'll get it. That's just the way it is. So when you are in a difficult situation, learn to rejoice. Learn to praise God, knowing that God is doing you good. Now, we don't like it physically. We don't like it mentally either. That's why I, I, I believe that, that it, you got a child, make sure that child's got some things to do around the house. His duties, here's his duty, he got it on the refrigerator. Trash, take the trash out. Make your bed up. Don't mark on the walls in your room. Give them responsibility. That's weights. And they, they learn to mature that way. I just love, uh, where's Rachel and Ch Charles and Rachel's little girl? Susan got, let me see this pocketbook there, honey. Man, what you got in there, baby? You got my lunch in there? <laughs> they're a little girl. She takes it out to the car with Miss Susan. Then I give her my satchel, she carries that <laughs> for Pastor Bob. And she feels so good about herself. She, she stood up there Wednesday night, was singing with her mama. How many have seen that? Singing with mama. That blessed the socks off of me. And I went home with those socks. <laughs> now, let me say something. When you're going through a difficult a, a situation, most people just think about that all the time. And that's where you fail. Because the devil projects it in your mind and that's all you can think about. And you minister death to yourself. Hello? Anybody love me now? Very... Your big challenge will be get it off your mind and get your mind renewed by the word of God. And you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that means, yeah, I got a problem, but I'm not worried about it. Amen. And I'm going to sleep tonight. Because God will make a way where there is not no way. And I'm speaking from many years of experience. Susan and me had to believe we'd never ask people for money. We never have. This ministry has never went out and tried to uh, ask people for money. God has always put it on their heart. We always pray to God, and God puts it on people's hearts to give to this ministry. From the very start, 50-some years ago. Not one time. I, I, I preached, and I was the pastor of this church for 20 years. And Susan didn't receive no salary, and neither did I, and we weren't worried about it, because God, at that time, I had a good job, and God provided through that job out there, and we paid our, gave our tithes, raised three kids with braces, piano lessons, and all the stuff we have to pay on the kids. We trusted God. 
Now, I'm not saying you have it, but some of you are a little nervous. Just think you can live worry-free. Now, I'm just going to tell you what, you, you're taking it with Jesus. Jesus has cast all your cares upon me. Now, I'll ask you a question. If you've cast all your cares upon the Lord, how many cares do you have? None. None. But see, that fear, that self-survival, that, that thing that's built into us, oh, we think we got to worry a whole lot. You know what that does for you? Tears your health down. Now you got to go to the doctor. Remember what the TV always says, ask your doctor. Ask your doctor. I haven't seen my doctor. And when I go in there, you know, he does his little thing, and he's gone. And I say, oh, he's gone. <laughs> Doc, you think I'm going to live? <laughs> he goes, <laughs> what are you saying, Doc? <laughs> How many of ever had a doctor sit down and really tell you what, what your problem is? Anybody? Well, y'all, what's their name? <laughs> Most of my doctors, I look better than all of them. They're just 39. I'm 82 and I'm looking great, wonderful, telling jokes, talking about Jesus. And, you know, and uh, I said, let me take that thing off you. And I put it in my ear and I checked their heart. Where's your heart at, man? <laughs> Oh, I feel it back there in your pocketbook. <laughs> All right, church, behave yourself. All right. <clears throat> now, listen. God has given us grace, abundance of grace. Say, God's given me abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. For what? <laughs> to reign in this life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 5, 17. So we've got it. It's a free gift. Well, Bob, you don't really have, you know, a whole lot. Oh, you, <laughs> you'd probably fall out of the chair if you found out what that woman and me had to go through in our lifetime. You just have your little teeny family and yourself to take care of. Look who I got to take care of. Every time one of you are hurting, I get that hurt, and I say, God, I give it to you. I give it to you. So we have to learn to give God, not just ourselves, but give him all of everything that can bother us and put our faith and trust in him alone. And if you're going to be changed, it will be by the power of God as you appropriate the promises of God by faith and you trust him to bring it to pass in your life. You got that? Because you're going to be spinning your wheels if you don't. God is well able to perfect us. Got 10 minutes. We're going to let you go. Now, let's finish this. Next verse. So what is nature doing? Waiting for the sons of God to be manifest. And who's the son of God? sons of God? You and me. We know that the whole creation of irrational creatures has been mourning together in the pains of labor until now. A lot, let me say something. A lot of your groanings and moanings is really moaning and groaning for that glorified body. I remember one time I asked God that question. That's just a natural process of the, of the, of the, of the fallen nature in us, longing, groaning. Oh, God, if I could just see you. Oh, if I could just bathe in your presence for five minutes. One day you will. One day you'll be right there with God. Turn to the next verse. You've got to move fast. And not only the creation, but we ourselves too, we ourselves too, us Christians too, who have and enjoy the first fruits of the Holy Spirit, a foretaste of the blissful things to come, grown inwardly as we wait for the redemption of our bodies. 
These bodies are groaning and moaning for deliverance from the pains and the, the affliction that our bodies feel because of the fall. Because our bodies have not been redeemed yet, but what are we doing? Talking about the redemption of our bodies. Say redemption of our bodies. Is your body redeemed yet? I want to shake your hand. <laughs> so you'll be doing some groaning and moaning, but don't you worry about it. That's natural. But you stand up and remember, the sufferings of this world cannot be compared to the glory that is waiting on the sons of God and the daughters of God. Keep that in mind. In fact, we might be out of here quicker than you think. If you see what's going on over there in the Middle East. On Wednesday night, I'm talking about prophecy. You'll see it on the Internet. You can hook onto the Internet. You got DVDs back there. I encourage you to get it. For 50 years, I have studied it, read the commentaries, listened to many men of God. And come down with my little simple way of explaining it. Look what it says. But we ourselves too. Who have and enjoy the first fruits of the Holy Spirit. Which is a foretaste. And by the way. We are sealed by the Holy Ghost. That's God's stamp upon you as, and me as the children of God. We belong to God. We don't belong to ourselves. We wait for the redemption of our bodies from sensuality and the grave, which will, be which will reveal our adoption, our manifestations as God's sons. Now that's future tense. It's just down the road. And people are, we are living in a day in which many people are falling and departing from the faith. Timothy tells us that. Now you got to be in the faith to depart it. Now as a shepherd that bothers me. But I have to give it to God. Susan and me have spent money. We've spent time with people. Try, and so some of the, our ministers here. To try to get people established. To be strong in the Lord and realize that they have the free gift of righteousness and the abundance of grace and mercy to reign, to reign, to reign in this life right here in these mortal bodies and be victorious. Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm running out of time. I got to move fast. I, I'm sorry, but I, all right, let's move on. I got five minutes. What's the next verse? For in this hope we were saved, but hope, the object of which is seen, is not hope. For how can we one hope for what he already sees? So we don't see it right now, but we hope for it. Are you going to graduate? I hope so. But we're still in school. I hope so. We're going to graduate. We're going to graduate. I tell you that right. All right, I want you to turn real quick to Romans chapter 10. Uh, and I'm going to skip some things here. Oh, boy. All right, let's, let's, let's start with verse 6. Romans chapter 10, verse 6. And I'm going to move fast. I'm just going to read and you'll see it. Here we go. But the righteousness based on faith imputed by God and brings righteousness with him says. Notice what it says. Everybody say says. says. That's where our confession comes in. We say what we believe. Remember 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 6 verse 13. We say what we believe. What do you believe? Then learn to say it. Now, this is important, that word say. 
and brings right relationship with him. That is God. Into heaven says, that is to bring is Christ down. He's already came down here. He's ascended into heaven. Next verse. We'll move right on. There we go. Or who will descend into the pit, that is to bring Christ up from the dead, as if we could be saved by our own efforts. Yeah, but I was a good boy. I gave my wife a lick of my ice cream last week. I gave two cents to church the other day. No, not by our effort. Next verse. But what does it say? But what does it say? But what does it say? The word God message in Christ is near you. It is where? Where is it at? Who? Where is it? Near you on your lips and in your heart. That is the word, the message, the basis and object of faith which we preach. Next verse. So it's right in your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Because if you acknowledge and confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and in your heart believe, a heave to trust and rely on the truth that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's why we have people to confess it. Because, notice the next verse now. Next verse. For with the heart a person believes, a heave to trust in and relies on Christ, and so is justified, declared righteous, acceptable to God. And with the mouth he confesses, declares openly, speaks out freely his faith, and confirms his salvation. So when we speak it, amen, we confirm it. And Jesus said, if you acknowledge me before man, I will acknowledge you before my heavenly Father in heaven. But it's the same principle all through the Word of God. Whatever we need, we, gotta, we have to believe in our heart and confession. Put the um, next verse up there. The Scripture says, No man who believes in him, who adheres to, relies on, and trusts in him, will ever be put to shame or be disappointed. Now that's powerful. Now I want you to put the King James up there at verse 10.10. Verse 10, 10, King James, Charles. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Everybody say, with the mouth, with the mouth. Confession, confession is made, is made unto, salvation. unto salvation. Powerful. So how do you enter the salvation that Christ has provided? By believing in our hearts that God raised him from the dead and confess with your mouth unto salvation. Very important to open our mouths and speak what we believe. Not what we feel. Because we don't always feel it. But we always feel something. But learn to stand on your faith. Father, we want to thank you now for the total victory of Calvary. We thank you, Father, that We've learned that what we say is very important. And we want to thank you, Lord, that when we do pray, believe that we receive what we pray and it shall be done unto us. And we want to thank you now. And Lord, if there's anyone in here that is not sure of their salvation, may they confirm it today through confession and come up and talk to me. And I want to thank you for that now. In Jesus' name, amen.